Okay, I think I'm recording. Yes, okay. So um, today in class, uh, we are gonna be talking about Anne Sexton some more. You're gonna be reporting back for your groups on the different poems um, that you guys wrote about and turned in, hopefully. Then we're gonna be moving on to Sylvia Plath. Um, I've decided to, in, to um, tell you about the paper on Tuesday in person, because I want to pass out a piece of paper and I think there'll be more people present. Um, and so my goal tonight is to not keep you the entire time, um, but I would like to give justice to both Anne Sexton and an introduction to Sylvia Plath, who are pretty amazing poets. Um, but before we begin, I do want to just share a, a personal thing that happened today. Um, I got to go to the reading I told you guys about. Um, the poet Ada Lamon um, was reading at Santa Rosa Junior College and I got to attend in person. And Ada is a friend. She grew up in Sonoma and she went to NYU like me and we have you know, mutual friends. And so I got to finally give my friend who is now the poet laureate of the United States a big hug and just be like, oh my God, I can't believe you're poet laureate of the United States. It was so cool, you guys. So if you haven't read Ada Lamone's work, um, I highly recommend it. Um, if you didn't get to the reading, I'm sure it was recorded. And as soon as I get the recording, I will send it to you. And that is another opportunity for extra credit is listening to the 10 poems that she reads. Um, she, was in, she was reading from her new book, which is called The Hurting Kind. Um, but she has five other books that she has published before that all of which are incredible. I love Bright Dead Things, which is a, a great book. So um, I highly recommend checking her out if you haven't already. She is a modern American poet. So any questions about that? Did you also perform at the Santa uh, College thing? I did not give a reading there. No, I was just in the audience today. Hmm. I was going to yeah. say, do you have, um, is there like a YouTube or something for poets? Is there a YouTube for poets? Um, there's a, yes, there's a lot of readings on YouTube. Like I, I'm on a lot of YouTube videos of poets. Yes. No, I, no, do a lot of I meant like, you know how filmmakers like use YouTube and Netflix? Is oh there yeah. Like a platform for poets where like they publish their writings? So more for poets, we publish um, books and then we promote them through YouTube and Instagram is big and Twitter used to be really big. I don't know about it anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, those are the platforms, but it's, you know, the book is what you're, is the thing that you're communicating, but there are people that, um, you know, all of the big readings that, that we do are often, archive on YouTube. Okay. Um, do you uh, have do you have any books published? I do. I have four books of poetry and one biography. Yes. Are they on Amazon? They are. You can look me up. Okay. I got a website and everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I have I have a um a biography and four books of poems. And I yeah, that's I and I'm working on my second biography now and my next book of poems. Well, not right now, but after the quarter's over. <laughs> um, I was going to ask, uh, since I feel like you've already read your books, well, you re rewrote them. Uh, if I was out of the non biographical books, which one would you recommend? Of my books? Yeah. Well, I always like my latest one. So my latest book is called West colon fire colon archive and it is kind of like um the idea is it's three archival boxes and in the first archival box you'll find me talking back to the idea of biography it's not an actual box but it's just you know that's the concept and then the second box is me talking back to autobiography so i i'm i wrote it while i was poet laureate of sonoma county and we had the 2017 fires and at the same time, my mom was dying of ovarian cancer. So it was a really, yeah, intense time. And then the third section is, the, is talking back to history. 
So I challenge the idea of the American West, how it just depicts like white dudes on horses, you know, and uh, doesn't really tell the full story of the West. Um, so that's my work is kind of in that in that vein. So that's my latest book. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about um, our poet, Anne Sexton. Um, what I'm gonna do, sorry, I can find my book. It's so weird to not, to not have video. Um, so what we're gonna do is have, I'm put these in the, in the, um, I'm gonna stop sharing. Put these in the chat. Okay, so um, what we're gonna do is go through the different groups. Um, we talked about Cinderella as a class last time. Um, so obviously we will not be talking about Cinderella, um, but we will be talking about Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Is there someone from the Snow White and the Seven Dwarves group present? Otherwise known as group one. I'm present. Yay, Bianca's here. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about um, Snow White and Seven Dwarves? Um, yeah, can I pull up um, the response really quick, if that's okay? Of course. Thank you. And are and Andrew and Logan, are you also in group one? They're here too. Yeah, they are. Okay. okay. Sorry. while you're pulling that up, I'm gonna, read, I'm gonna read the first stanza from it, okay? Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. No matter what life you lead, the virgin is a lovely number. Cheeks as fragile as cigarette paper. Arms and legs made of limoges, lips like Vin du Rhone, rolling her china blue doll eyes open and shut, open to say, good day, mama, and shut for the thrust of the unicorn. She is unsoiled. She is as white as a bonefish. Are you ready, Bianca and yeah. Andrew and Lo Logan? Yeah. Could you guys share your videos, Logan and Andrew? Yes, give me a sec. Thanks. Um, maybe we could each just, just talk about like our paragraphs. I'll start off, bear with me. I'm sorry, I'm so sick, so I sound so bad. Okay. Um, but basically, um, so I talked about how there were a lot of similarities between Sexton's poem um, and the Grimm's story. Um, frankly, there, there was like everything was almost the same, except um, the hunter, when he went to go um, bring back Snow White's heart, he brought back um, the boar's heart instead of like the liver and the lungs, I believe it was. Um, which is what the evil stepmother ate. Um, but one thing I talked about was um, how Sexton adds like that sense of humor to her um, telling of the story, which I find really interesting. Um, I talked mostly about the evil stepmother um, and kind of about beauty um, in a sense and how um, Sexton alludes to the idea that beauty is like shallow and meaningless at the end of the day, um, which is ironic because obviously the whole story is based upon like jealousy and beauty. Um, and I do believe that because of that, um, Sexton does provide a feminist retelling of the fairy tale. Um, her perspective of beauty is a form of feminism in my opinion, um, because she shows that beauty is meaningless and there's, you know, there's, there's much more I guess than that. Um, the queen did sought out to kill her own stepdaughter because of beauty, but ended up failing. Um, so she demonstrates how like perfection, according to the magic mirror, is just it's a way that like perfection is perceived. It's not like a a fact per se, but that's kind of what I talked about. Awesome. Great. Um, my voice is also a little messed up too right now. Sorry, but I, uh, 
I kind of capitalized on the idea of beauty being at a much less uh, importance. And I used uh, the scene after Snow White eats the apple and falls into her death-like sleep. <clears throat> I started talking about uh, the, the, the subtle differences between how the Grimm's described the process of putting Snow White in this glass coffin and how Sexton describes it in that the Grimm's, they have her on this like <clears throat> almost ethereal display where she's sitting on you know above the the black sullied earth and she's in this glass coffin and these animals you know they're paying her a visit it's almost like they're equating her beauty with something that rivals nature and I interpreted that as this um <clears throat> I guess this equation of beauty being some sort of natural thing or like something that <clears throat> all you know women have to have and you know Snow White was just born with this but in <clears throat> in a Sexton's view or, or a Sexton's retelling, there was this, um, there, if it didn't feel rushed, but, and there were certain like key bits in the story that transferred over, uh, be it as references or just as, you know, something intentional on that, you know, the, the black earth, the, the glass coffin and the fact that they kind of had her on display, but there was also so much less emphasis on this uh like reverence like there was no one guarding her these nature these natural animals they, they didn't like you know look at her and even if someone passed by it was just kind of it was described as a sort of like a peak instead of this uh you know like holding this vigil like vigil for her and i i kind of yeah that I, I built off of that so i do believe that uh the sexton's retelling is a feminist one and yeah yeah awesome thank you logan and andrew do you have anything to add yeah, um, I mainly focused on um, the huntsman and the prince in my um, reading response. Um, I wrote about how the way the huntsman was um, portrayed to be less transactional than the original Grimm story in the way that like, um, Snow White is not described with like sentimentalism um, where like in the Grimm story, um, the writers write like, the huntsman was about to stab Snow White's innocent heart when she began to cry. Because she was so beautiful, the huntsman took pity on her and he said, run away, you poor child. Versus like um, in Sexton, it's like very like, it's like very bare with like adjectives and like the emotional tear of the heart. It just says that like the hunter, however, let his prisoner go. And that's all there is to say. And so I was writing about how like, it seems like Sexton doesn't want um, to write in a male centered narrative. So I wrote about how like she avoids like damsels in distress Mm -hmm. and that she's like opposing intimacy um, at the cost of women surviving and meeting societal expectations and so um I thought that was like pretty cool or that's what caught my attention but then when it came around to the prince being introduced in the poem I saw that it was very similar to the original Grimm story and I thought that that was that was was um, opposing the argument that I was making that Sexton was opposing like traditional intimacy in the in the woman's position. And then I thought that maybe the way that Sexton portrayed the prince, like him taking Snow White and like marrying her off, marrying her and like having a happily ever after is an implicit way to say that um, women have this inescapable struggle of creating self-value without the association and proximity to a man and the service that they can provide. And so I guess like Sexton's trying to say that like, um, that like if women are, um, if, um, what was I trying to say? Yeah, I feel like Sexton was just trying to like juxtapose um, between like the huntsman and the prince to say that like societal expectations are just really hard to break from and women are um, 
constantly um, responding to like these external factors or these worldly forces that they can't really like escape from. So like gender roles. Right. Um, yeah, good. I was trying, yeah, I was trying to dig deeper, but um, yeah. No, that's good. I think that's a that's a really good. You guys, as a group, did a really good job with the analysis. Does anyone have questions for the first group before we move on? You should definitely take a look at the chat. <laughs> oh, look at those cameras going on! I love it. It's like Christmas, lighting up in here. No questions for group one? Okay, how about group two, Rumpelstiltskin? Do we have people from group two here today? Yeah. Great. This is um, on page 17, Rumpelstiltskin. <laughs> Sorry, let me pull it up. I'll read the first stanza while you're pulling up your stuff, okay? Rumpelstiltskin. Inside many of us is a small old man who wants to get out. No bigger than a two-year-old whom you'd call a lamb chop. Yet this one is old and malformed. His head is okay, but the rest of him wasn't sanforized. He is a monster of despair. He is all decay. He speaks up as tiny as an earphone with Truman's asexual voice. I am your dwarf, I am the enemy within, I am the boss of your dreams. No, I am the law in your mind, the grandfather of watchfulness. I am the law of your members, the kindred of blackness and impulse. See, your hand shakes, it's not palsy or booze. It's your, it is your doppelganger trying to get out. Beware, beware. Brian, are you all by yourself? Uh, no, uh, Layla's here. Layla, all right, let's, where are you, Layla? Uh, here? There you um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll talk about, uh, kind of ripples, like the differences, um, in like the ripples silk skin, the way they're portrayed and, um, a little bit of the feminist critique. Um, so Rumpelstiltskin is depicted uh, as a bit more sympathetic in this compared to the Grimm's telling. Um, you can see this kind of through the repeated line and no child will ever call me Papa that he makes. Uh, and then there's this kind of uh, equa uh, the equation of... Um, human uh human or him being human and like uh the parenthood um when he's talking about uh but he wanted only this a living thing to call his own and being mortal uh who could blame him so um there, she, she's uh his desire for paternity um kind of comes out of this the sense of loneliness and um so somehow this like kind of um I don't know, it humanizes him in a way, um, rather than having him be a villain. Um, and so I think that's kind of what she was doing here, or it seems to me that that's what she's doing here. Um, uh, the, um, her introduction um, at the beginning of the tale points out that the, that the Rumpelstiltskin is an aspect of, of, of ourselves or of people um that somehow uh we want to forget um and this is kind of seen in the quote inside many of us is a small old man who wants to get out and i am the law of your members the uh kindred of blackness and impulse uh see your hands shakes <laughs> it's not palsy or booze it's your doppelganger um good yeah, that's such a, that's such a, those are such striking lines, aren't they? Like the idea that we have a little, this little evil bad right. side inside us. And um, so it's kind of, I, I think it's interesting that she takes this, this, uh, 
this fairy tale form and uses it as a way to comment on the other and the, like the denial um and the ability to forget that the other uh the other's humanity um and how it's kind of a dangerous game because that's uh, inside of us as well um what else uh Layla do you have anything to add um yeah so we also talked about how so the her poem is very very similar to the original but she does like expand on the character's motivations like we said with Rumpelstiltskin he's more humanized and he like you get the sense that he wants to be a father rather than just wants to take this girl's child away but on the other hand the you know the girl who's making the deal with Rumpelstiltskin she seems to be less enthusiastic about being a mother like uh, there's this one line uh, talking about you know, breastfeeding her baby and it says uh, she gave him her dumb lactation which kind of implies a very kind of apathetic view towards being a mother so it kind of so it could be like a feminist critique on societal you know expectations of all women wanting to be mothers and wanting and being perfect caretakers whereas you have Rumpelstiltskin you know a, a man I guess who actively wants to take on that father role so I don't know good yeah I like that there's a lot of references too to modern things too did you guys see those like the uh, yes uh there's like mention of like sanforized which I can't remember what it meant there's Fort Knox and Truman, Truman. And, then... and the cigarette paper right thin as cigarette paper mm -hmm. what's that yeah, it's cool. So that she's doing this kind of the, similar to, I mean, in some ways it's similar to Elliot's collage, right? What she's doing only it's much more pop culture in her time period. Good, any questions for group two? Oh, Lorraine has got a question for you guys. You guys see it? Good job, uh, Lorraine, yeah. asking a question. Um, no, if I remember correctly, um, I'd have to go back and like look it up. But he's just kind of uh, a villain, if I uh, if I'm remembering it correctly. In the he's just kind of this weird entity that shows up and uh, wants the baby. Um, yeah. Any other questions, you guys? Yeah. Um... So does sex to men depict him as all good, do you think? Or do you think she is also admitting to some of the negatives of Rumpelstiltskin that Grimm had? Um, she's definitely not depicting him as all good. Um, but I think she's trying to show that even these, the like the other that I was talking about, deserve some amount of pity and consideration. Um, and to not dehumanize them in the way that uh, it, the Rumpel Silt skin is in the original one. Good. Good job, you guys. Okay, our third group is Rapunzel, which um, begins with a woman who loves a woman is forever young. The mentor and the student feed off each other. Many a girl had an aunt who locked her in the study to keep the boys away. They would play rummy or lie on the couch and touch and touch, old breast against young breast. Let your dress fall on, down your sh shoulder. Come touch a copy of you, for I am at the mercy of rain, for I have left the three Christs of Hypsanti, for I have left the long naps of Ann Arbor, and the church fires have turned to stumps. The sea bangs into my cloister. For the young politicians are dying, are dying. So hold me, my young dear, hold me. That's how Rapunzel begins. Who's in group three? Oh, I was. Oh, good. Haley, are you alone or is there someone else here? Um, I'm here too. Oh, good. Alana? Yeah. Great. Anyone else? Okay, well, let's hear what you guys have to say about 
Rumpelstilt, uh, sorry, Rapunzel, not Rumpelstiltskin. And the rest of the class can think of maybe some questions to ask if they have any. Okay, yeah. Um, so I focus mainly on, mainly on the modern references. So I'll try and like quickly sum up what other people talked about. So um, this poem is sort of like separated into two sections. We've got like a lot of, where honestly a lot of the modern references come in at the beginning and then you've got sort of more of the traditional story that follows afterwards. Um, and in the beginning, there's a lot of, it, it depicts a relationship between an older woman and a younger uh, woman. Um, I I don't think there was any like specific relationship between the two. I think it was like depicted in several different formats. Um, so some of the modern references, um, particularly in that first section before the, the story include um, Ann Arbor, which is a city in Michigan, the three Christs of Ypsilanti, which is a psychi psychiatric case study, um, New York City and Isadora Duncan, which was um, a dancer. And each of these, um, well, I'll go one by one. New York City was referenced as falling in, suggesting like, which I thought suggested this predicted downfall of modern society. Um, sort of followed by the idea of my young dear hold me. She's there's sort of like this inside and outside world being constructed um, by Sexton that sort of depicts the outside world as sort of like a dangerous kind of space. And this this space that the two women have created within where, wherever they are in their like home spaces is safe, which I felt like kind of tied back to the Rapunzel tale pretty well with that dynamic of, of outside and inside. Um, and then the references to Aunt Arbor and the cre three Christ of Ypsilanti depict this, um, oh yeah, the departure. And then I thought the really interesting thing was the mention of Isidore Duncan because she's used as a comparison to the witch's garden, which is sort of basically inserting a modern reference straight into the traditional fairy tale and giving modern readers like um, this, this reference to someone who they may understand that can sort of like give them this connection to, to a, to a story that's so old. Um, and I thought that that was just an interesting setup for the, the story that follows to have this, this modern depiction of, of older adult and younger female um, love. Awesome, Haley, thank you. Lana? Yeah, so I focused mostly, mostly on how this was like a feminist reading or if it was a feminist reading. Um, and so we thought it was very similar to Elizabeth Bishop's uh, Sestina, where there's this relationship between, you know, the child and her grandmother and Sestina. And here uh, we have a very similar relationship to that by introducing intergenerational uh, feminine dynamics uh, between Rapunzel and Mother Gothel. Um, so there's these, these really like interesting specific interactions that uh, Sexton adds in that were not in the Grimm tale, uh, such as like Mother Gothel playing games with Rapunzel and like specifically holding her and talking about like, oh, like my child, my child. Um, and so it establishes this as like a real like functioning relationship. Um, whereas the original tale was more of like, this is a captor and this is their captive. Um, and so there's a different power dynamic there. Um, Mother Gothel is also given a name. Um, she's more of a sort, she's just called a sorceress in the Grimm. And the fact that she's only referred to as a witch is kind of like demystifying like her powers and makes her more human. Um, also Rapunzel is much more human because we see her really going through this moment of not understanding um, what the prince is because he doesn't really fit the image of humans that she has in her mind uh, because she's only been around women. Um, and so this is a really interesting, like very unique gynocentric view of the world, um, which is a very, I think it's a very interesting imaginative retelling. Um, and so this really frames the prince as kind of like a usurper to this way of life that she has, where she's just like chilling out in the tower, um, relaxing, playing with her mother. Um, and then when he, when, when the prince eventually takes Rapunzel away, um, there's this line that's like, this proves that mother me do can be outgrown. And then it's like the world some say is made of couples. Um, but then the following stanza, the final stanza is about how upset mother Gothel is at the loss of her child. Um, and so it kind of goes back and disproves that. So that line kind of has this little ironic meaning to it um, by splitting up the mother child couple uh, by introducing the prince. It's also a lot more feminist in that um, 
you know, in the original tale, Mother Gothel doesn't really get an ending. It's just like, and then Rapunzel went away with the prince and they were happy, yay. Um, and in this one, you know, she's, we get to see her upset and we get to see the ways in which uh, this very uh, truly like interruption to her life has hurt her. Um, and so it becomes very bittersweet and it, it it kind of like shows the only way that that like this can happen is through a mother's sacrifice. Good, I like that. And it, it, there's a similarity right to the ending of this poem and the ending of Cinderella, that kind of ironic ending of questioning the happy ending that's kind of applied to it, right? Good, any questions for group three? How about group four, Red Riding Hood? Are you guys here? Yes. All right. Okay. Um, unless anybody, unless we want to do it like split, I might just start and go through as much as I can think of and then y'all fill in the gaps. Thoughts? Hmm. Good. What do you think? It's, so it's, uh, who else? It's, it's Elliot. And me, Mark. Elliot, Caroline, and then where is... Elizabeth, is Elizabeth here? I don't. I don't know. think so. so. Okay, yeah. well, it's us three. Um, okay, okay, go for it. I think Elizabeth wrote the first part anyway, so I'll just start with that. Um, so, she frames the poem from the very first line, um, writing "Many are the deceivers," which sets us up to think deeper about the deception of the characters, both in the examples and in the retelling of the story. Uh, rather than getting distracted by the surrounding material as much. So the first half of the poem actually is four different examples of deception. And we noted that this was a, a pattern that was kind of similar to Elizabeth Bishop's one art, where the, each successive example seems to get um, closer to the poet's true experience, like it starts farther away and then uh, gets closer to the on the nose. So all of the examples appear to be set in modern times, um, possibly as a way to show that de deception transcends time periods. The first example is of a matron, which implies that she's married, who's meeting with her lover. Um, Sexton focuses on the woman's feelings, um, nervousness, excitement, as seen by like the, the metaphor of helium in her stomach. Yeah, letting her stomach fill up with helium, letting her arms go loose as kite tails, getting ready to meet her lover. Um, I, don't know, I read that personally as excitement and nervousness. And then she juxtaposes it with mundane, the mundane shopping items on her list kind of uh, to help us see that this wasn't just a normal day for the character person. Um, this portrayal of the woman though is not judgmental, which kind of pulls in the feminist view because um, Sexton slash the speaker just seemed to kind of accept the woman's autonomy in her choices, even if it's an example that most people would think is problematic or like a lot of women would be demonized in this situation. She's not in this case. She's her choices are allowed. Um, the second example is two con women who deceive another woman. Um, and then like just to kind of gloss over it. A little of the feminism in this section seems to kind of point out the complexity of women by juxtaposing the immoral conniving con woman with the naive Jenny who gives them all her money. Um, I don't know if there's too much to say about that. Do either of you want to add anything to that part so far? I can't see. Good. Okay. Um, the third example is, you know, getting closer to Sexton's, com uh, Sexton's experiences. Um, this is a comedian, which with a modern reference is on The Tonight Show, um, which wouldn't have been around in the Grimm Brothers time. And ultimately he's depicted as committing suicide in this section, um, bleeding himself out. And we know that Sexton also ended up taking her own life in the end, despite her success as a poet. Um, so that's kind of where that connection comes from. And his deception in this case is that, you know, he's a very successful comedian he gets his his uh, audience to laugh and have a good time, and then he goes home and he's, you know, ruined on the inside to the point that he takes his own life. Um, and then the fourth, maybe Sexton speaking herself, or at least a speaker that's conveying some of her more personal thoughts, um, where this 
character speaker is um, noting how she is collected at cocktail parties, um, but then internally is going through open heart surgery. That's a quotation, which we take as a metaphor for her struggles at the time. Um, and then it leads into kind of a nostalgia for her lost or the lost happiness of her childhood, um, where her got my camera lost. back. Sorry, very excited. <laughs> Yay. Uh, where her childhood bed lay, oh, the bed was stale with my childhood, and I could not move to another city where the worthy make a new life. Um, so clearly she's not in a good place right now. And then she transitions into the actual retelling of the tale um, and separates it both in cadence and tone, as well as by putting the time very far away from the previous examples by starting with long ago. Um, and... So with this, it's overall very similar to the Grimm version. Um, there are a few differences. I will let my partners maybe fill in a little bit of that part. Elliot, did you do part of the first part of the story? I, I did the most of the first half. Okay, was it? But, kinda... but could I add in a little bit more? Yeah, to please the last? do. <laughs> so all of the first half is kind of, all, even though the stories seem like they're about other people, really it looks like, Finn is mirroring uh, her own experiences off of these people. And then in the final um, final paragraph, it's brought back to her self-reference. And she's talking about looking out through the window and seeing the, the ocean and um, while well also noting that everything inside her home being reproached by her mother and her own bed being stale with childhood, you know, some kind of malady, then it's like um it's like deceiving it, okay it will become the deception here isn't really unveiled until the last paragraph last stanza of the entire poem when she says that uh th that red riding hood was not able to appreciate being inside of the wolf's stomach and i think that she's equating the wolf's stomach to her own home and uh, also there's maybe an alternative reading to this um, because suicide um, being taken by the ocean is kind of a literary symbol of suicide sometimes I've seen it and uh, so she could also be noting that she's wondering to kill herself thinking contemplating suicide in the last stanza of the first half okay that's my contribution good are you referring to um oh. i'm sorry the awakening is that is that your reference to being swallowed by the awakening by kate chopin mm -hmm. the suicide of the ocean oh yes okay <laughs> and also in the bell jar yes in the bell jar. i think there's a couple there's there's a couple i read in also good morning monster anyway Okay. I yeah. Don't know, I no, there are a lot that. of references. I like that yeah. observation. Good. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. It looks like Sarah okay. has a question. Yeah, I was actually just going to say, um, I'm reading The Awakening and writing a paper on it for a different class. And I think this is definitely a reference to that. Um, for those of you who haven't read it, this woman decides she is no longer fulfilled as a woman in her marriage. Um, and goes out and meets people and lovers, but eventually kills herself by just walking into the sea and like letting her feminism just wash away. And I think this is definitely a reference to that. Oh, well, she does that because she doesn't have other options, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. she's sort of pushed into the corner of that, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah, good, good. I I'm glad you're reading that. It's a very important book. Good. Keep going, you guys. Any more to, to add to it? Oh, um, I was just going to mention, um, going off of um, like what they said earlier, um, the references to like modern day, well, at the time, uh, the modern like references help to both like connect the reader to like the context of what's going on in like the Grimm's Brothers story and relating it to something that they would probably know. Because um, it also provides like a bit of commentary on behalf of Saxon because um, I think they mentioned the quote earlier of like 
uh, where is it? Oh, my bad. There's a lot of writing on here. <laughs> okay. um, where? Oh, why can't I find it? But it was the one where um, they were critiquing like why not penicillin and why like wine and cake. Um, I thought that was like very like breaking the fourth wall a little bit. It's like giving this judgmental tone, um, and it's done like here and there throughout the the whole story. So I thought that was a way that like Sexton like provides a bit of narration that also connects to us like the reader now like why like yeah that makes sense like why are you like not giving them medicine not bringing medicine but instead of bringing like these like goodies and stuff um so I thought that would like allow us for like a better connection with the reader these like modern references um I like that yeah, yeah. it is interesting how she interrupts like that she's like wait a second it's yeah, kind of like how Kurt Vonnegut inter inter interrupts in the introduction, right? And he's talking about how Cinderella doesn't actually have a glass slip slipper. It was actually like a fur boot, right? Like. <laughs> um, and then for a bit of the ending, I know I didn't work on like the ending part of it, but um, they mentioned that it was like trying to be a bit uh, feministic just because they show like no remorse for their actions in this version. Um, I think what was it? They like they cook them, right? They cook the wolf. If I not they don't mistaken. eat the wolf in this version, but okay. they they fill them with rocks, like in the original, and then um, they eat the cake and wine over the corpse of the wolf, and, which is again kind of similar to the original. But um, one difference that I thought was kind of notable is the Huntsman doesn't skin the wolf in Sexton's version and get that trophy, um, which I think kind of pulls away from the idea of like the savior complex and puts it, the emphasis back on the actual victims of the story. Um, yeah. Good. And one other thing from the end of it is Little Red Riding Hood or Red Riding Hood, I guess, doesn't come out crying in this version where she does in the Grimm version, um, which after hearing Elliot's, Elliot's point a little bit more, could have been that she was already kind of accepting her fate and didn't really care about dying. Um, but I had kind of read it a little differently. I was just like, um, she just wasn't really phased by it because uh, like she, rather than being a delicate flower, which she also was described as coming out of the wolf's stomach as a type of flower. Was it a poppy? Yeah. Red Riding Hood out like a poppy quite alive from the kingdom of the belly, um, which, you know, the the connection of a woman figure or woman character to a flower kind of draws attention to how women are often portrayed as delicate and um, frail and beautiful. But in this case, um, she clearly isn't that delicate because she's not phased at all by the trauma that she just went through. And then they all agree the, about how they want to punish the wolf for his like consuming them um so it wasn't just the hun huntsman that came up with the brutal idea of you know don't just shoot him let's fill him with rocks so that he and then um i think in the original he was drowned in the trough but in this case they just let the weight of the rocks kill him and and yeah which is arguably worse um <laughs> so <laughs> it was just quite brutal and i think in that sense it's also more feminist because you know it kind of puts the the idea that women can be overtly brutal too and vengeful and all of that and I think yeah that's the main good. thing I wanted to add good job you guys any questions for group four before we go on to group five Hansel and Gretel oh, who is the comedian mentioned does anyone know I have a question do um do, do people with the hardcover or the, sorry, the hard copy. Um, is it? Is there an, indent, an indented introduction in? Because I have a I have a digital version. I don't know if the formatting has changed. Is there an introduction? Yeah, like how each one of these poems usually has like an indented introduction, or is that just on the digital copy? That might just be. So they look like like this. Okay. Never mind then. What does yours look like? It has a it has a little introduction. So there's parts that there's like a section that's like indented over, like it the the whole like stanza 
or more is like tabbed over a little bit and then it changes back to like back to being normal so i was uh but the only one that didn't have that was red riding hood and um the one after that the maiden without hands so i was I thought it was i thought she was doing something there but uh it appears it's just a digital thing so never mind <laughs> i think it's a digital thing yeah okay. i wish she was doing something and it looks like we have a question about the comedian mentioned in the poem that that's entertaining Johnny Carson. I don't think that's something we can that we can find. Yeah, I don't it's not listed in the actual poem. Um, we didn't research it because I, I just assumed that it was like a made up example just because, you know, in the um, entertainment industry, it's not that uncommon to see that kind of thing. So I just kind of presumed that it was um, kind of like a straw man figure to yeah <laughs> to go to be like the representation of the entertainment industry figures who go through their mental health struggles good yeah I think you're right all right we need Hansel and Gretel this was a tale that came from this terrible time in the middle ages when there was no food for like a decade and people would truly leave their children in the forest. It's from a true story. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, so that would be me. That would be Nicole, Nikki, and is Barbara here too? I know I saw Nicole and Nikki earlier, but... Nikki's here and Nicole's here. Yes, I don't see Barbara. Yeah, I guess I can just go through as what I can and then if they have anything to add, they can pop in every time I come up here like all of my thoughts just fly out of my head so it's okay be a little be bit organized. uh let's see so uh just in terms of things that Sexton did differently than the original Grimm's version um Gretel is like the biggest difference that I saw uh she has like a much larger and more crucial role which sounds odd because she's still the one that defeats the witch and actually uh in the original version she does this cool thing where she calls a swan to help them over a river which he doesn't do in Sexton's version but, you know, in the Grimm's version, she spends like the majority of the first half up until killing the witch, just like kind of crying and being generally unhelpful. Uh, whereas Sexton, it seems that she sees Gretel's lack of involvement as like an integral part of her character. She explicitly points it out. Uh, where is that line? It's like, uh, she, uh, she who had said nothing up until this point, she who uh, uh, nodded her head and wept, uh, she who neither dropped pebbles or bread, bided her time like she's uh, her lack of involvement is like intentional um and then when she does kill the witch it's not like a an unexpected like oh this is like a great time to do some casual murder it's like a specific like she was biding her time up until that point um and then in contrast to Gretel's uh competence uh Hansel is more incompetent he makes more mistakes in the Grimm's tale like his stepmother like specifically has to lock the door to keep him from getting more pebbles and then he like has to resort to using the bread. And then this tale, he just decides to use the bread, which then leads him to the whole mess. Um, and then Hansel also only acts in reaction to the woman. So all of the major plot points, like um, getting the kids into the woods and then uh, killing the witch and then like the danger itself is the witch. Like that's all, you know, the woman's jobs. Like Hansel is just kind of reacting to the woman, which is great. It puts the power in the woman's hands. It gives them more of the agency. Um, and then an overall, the story is centered around family, family dynamics instead of the kids' adventures. Like, it's a mother, it's not a stepmother here. That seems to be a pattern with Sexton's uh, retellings. Um, puts power in just the things that the women do, child rearing, cooking, cleaning, traditionally women's things. Uh, and then just, uh, what was I going to say for this one? <laughs> um, I think I lost my train of thought there. But okay. yeah, sorry about this. Um, there's a thought that I was thinking of somewhere about how Gretel cooking the witch kind of mirrors the intro introduction parts. Um, Brian might version also has the indents. Um, not sure if that's just a weird thing in my copy, but uh, in the introduction part, we're talking about the mother and her son, like the mother eating her son. There's like a Gretel cooking the witch might like mirror that a little bit. I'm not sure what that does, but it is a thought I had. And then that would probably just be the main difference. You know, smaller differences would be the modern references, you know, soda, Houdini, Japanese flags, dials on ovens, 
um, and then cutting down the kids' adventures and the journey to and from the witch's house. Like it takes a whole like segment about how they have to trick the kids into the woods um, in the original version. And then Sexton just kind of cuts all that down and just has them end up in the woods. Um, has the parents just like put them in there and then leaves. Um, and yeah, that'd probably be the most of what I have to share. Uh, Nikki, Nicole, do you have anything to add? Maybe about like the what poets or the feminist retellings or? Um, I thought that it, it I'll go into the um the the feminist retellings, but I I thought a point um that I thought was really interesting that plays into the feminist retelling was that um in Sexton's version, she quotes that the evilness comes from the whole family. Like usually it's the stepmother that's, you know, push like um that's the where the evil comes from, but it was the whole family from the start, which I felt like um it says. Hansel and Gretel and their parents had come upon evil times, um, which cued me into maybe that it was going to be like a feminist um, poem. And then I kept flipping back and forth um, because at one point um, Sexton states that Hansel is, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find the, the, uh, the, the full quote, um, but basically, uh, oh, it says, then she took Hansel, the smarter, the bigger, the juicier into the barn and locked him up. Um, which just kind of felt like a, like, you know, your stereotypical, like sort of like stronger masculine character. Um, and that was, it was different than the original story. I, there was this added emphasis in masculinity that I found, um, where the original story, I, you know, it didn't have that big of an emphasis, but then, um, uh, of course, then, uh, Gretel comes in and, and saves the day. Um, you know, uh, she, she's seen very much as like the underdog. I felt like in both stories where she was sort of like the first story, she was definitely very passive. And then the second story, um, she, when being described, it wasn't smart and big and strong or like any of those, um, um, adjectives. It was just sort of like, um, just sort of, just sort of passive, but then, um, you know, she triumphs and pushes the, the witch into the into the oven and, and cooks her, um, which I thought was um, coming back around to the feminist retelling of the story um, and, and sort of this underdog feeling that I'm sure um, women could relate to. And then, you know, um, she, she mentions that, I think, in, in the story with Gretel. Um, trying to think what else. Um, cool. I thought her modern references were interesting in the way that she was using them she mentioned like coca-cola and houdini um the the witch's house was um a rococo house which is like like a, a very fancy schmancy mansion which i thought was um interesting and funny um but she was definitely playing upon the fact of um society's divide between like the rich and the poor um you know with this mention of the house and how the witch you know, had this big lavish house and these children were literally cast out because their their like parents couldn't um, feed them. Um, and um, I found that there were mentions of um, like modern mentions I felt or, or um, similarities between the story and, and mentions like in the Bible. Um, she says, each a hunk of bread like a page out of the bible and sent them out again um you know basically talking about how in, in such times that like there were when she was writing the poem people really had like they only really had faith to um to go off of to get them out of this hard times um even to the point like sexton was saying like they were like literally eating the paper um um which i think does play a part to the poverty and um the 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 hunger that people were going through um but that is what I have that was kind of all jumbled but that um... was good no it was good good job Nicole Nikki you want to add yeah I can add a little bit about the poets that we like compared her to so um we kind of talked about how we found connections with like HD and then T.S. Eliot and then also some like little bits of like Gertrude Stein um and like specifically for like HD um, we kind of noticed how like both Sexton and HD take works from like prior storytellers and like retell them in like some new and like exciting form. 
Um, and so like, especially like taking traditionally like masculine narratives and then transforming them to focus like on the women. So like with HD and Sappho, she's like taking her to like take the narrative of men betraying women in various ways and like spinning it to like put power in like women's hands. And then with Sexton, she's doing this with like grim fairy tales with like giving like agency to Gretel rather than like kind of mirroring grim, like the grim fairy tales and like having Gretel as this little girl who's crying the entire time and then like happening to be able to like kill the witch. Um, so I think like kind of transferring that agency uh, towards women um, and like discussing like their inner experiences rather than just like having the women being present as like just to move along the story, um, like kind of shows like that connection. Uh, and then for Elliot, we noticed like the use of collage. So um, you guys both <laughs> mentioned like the references to like Coca-Cola and all that. Um, oh, and then for Gertrude Stein, we just like really liked how like the mundane modern references like soda, astrology, like the dials on an oven, like was very much kind of like Gertrude Stein in the sense of like, focusing on the mundane and like incorporating it into like um, things that could have like deeper meanings. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Great job, you guys. Good. All right. Uh, we've got one more group and they worked on Briar Rose, Sleeping Beauty. Is anyone from group six here? I am. Oh, good. Lorena, anyone else? I am. Oh, I'm good. Yeah. Who else? Oh, Alexis? Yeah. Awesome. Can you turn on your camera just for this part? Yeah, I'll turn it on. Thank you. Uh, um, once my section starts. <laughs> okay, no problem. Yeah. Go ahead, you guys. Okay. Um, is Tasha here? Or Natalie? Don't see them. Okay, I'll read their part too then. Thank you. Um, so for references to the Grimm's version, uh, they talked about how, uh, let's see. They talked about how um, the princess is still like pricked by a needle and how, how there's references to thorns in both texts. And that, and the prince also wakes up Sleeping Beauty in both, both of the versions. And then, Haya, do you want to talk about yours? Um, I focus mainly on like the modern references. Um, Sexton refers to Munch's painting Scream when de describing how the king looked when the thirteenth fairy made the evil prophecy. And then um, also um, the king forced every male to score his tongue with Babo to avoid poisoning the air that Briar Rose walked in. Um, Babo is a cleaning product that is a cleanser with bleach. I just thought it was um, interesting how specific she had to be with that in um, Sexton, like including an actual brand of like bleach, you know? Um, but then it also, she's just um, adding in like mundane everyday products because in that same like little section, she says, um, she refers to a safety pin and saying that the king fastened the moon up with a safety pin to give her perpetual light. And then unlike the Grimm's version of the story, Sexton places emphasis on Briar Rose's struggle with um, sleep disorder of insomnia. And the poem includes the name of like an anesthetic drug like Novocaine in the line, I'm all shut up with Novocaine. And um, Sexton also refers to cigarettes in the line, her eyes burnt by cigarettes twice in the poem, first when describing the evil 13th fairy and um, Briar Rose later uses the phrase to describe her bad dreams of a faltering crone taking her place. Um, I think Sexton really just um, contrasts the usual like fairy tale depiction of um, the image of a magical fairy by describing this fairy with her eyes burnt by cigarette. It's kind of um, putting her in a like darker light. And then also that fairy tale happy ending of, you know, a prince and a, prince, a princess getting married is contrasted by um, the, her individual struggle with, you know, insomnia. 
and like needing to use drugs to numb that. Awesome. Good. Okay. Um, I said that uh, Sexton's version was a feminist retelling because she says that she married the prince and all went well. And when compared to the Grimm's version, it, we see the difference between she married him and he married her, which does kind of give um, Briar Rose agency. And then I also said that and all went well mocks this idea of happily ever after because we see how Sexton's version, um, Briar Rose has insomnia and I believe trauma from, from her father. And I talked about how, um, um, I quoted hand to hand, like uh, how the prin uh, the princess is handed hand to hand like a bowl of fruit, which emphasizes her lack of like control and um, the idea that she escaped one prison, her father, just to go to another one, the prince. Um, Good. And then I also said that like the repetition of daddy, like when she wakes up from her dreams is like a sign of trauma and like all the trauma she went through and is also like still living even though she escaped. Okay. Alexis, did you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, so for, oh, sorry, let me. Um, so for my section, it was, um, sorry, let me just go to my part. Oh, um, it was focusing on like the last question on like comparing her to other poems, to other poets, sorry. And I thought that the poet that um she most, that I could compare her to the, to the most was um Elizabeth Bishop. And I thought it was because of the way that um they both take tradition in their own way and change it to better suit what they're trying to express. So for Elizabeth Bishop, um, what really came to mind was um, like when um, we were talking about her using the villanelle, um, but she made it to talk about um, her her lover that passed away. And she also didn't, she also like bended the rules. She kind of had like what you were describing, I think like not so exactly like a box, but more like a a more like malleable mold, I guess, that's the <laughs> best way to describe it. Um, so I guess here it was because um, she was kind of, um, when we're talking about um, Sleeping Beauty, it was just, um, and like Cinderella too, it was just because they were, she was using, sorry, I just lost my trade of thought. Okay. Uh, she was, um, what's it called? She was using um, fairy tales to um, tell things from her perspective and they provide insight into what she values. And yeah. Good, very good. Thank you. You guys did such a great job on all of these different poems by Anne Sexton. And I do have you report them out like this because all of these poems are possible that they can be on the final, just like all the other ones that we've gone over in you know group work um the idea is not just to make you have to listen to everybody talk um but that by researching these poems and listening to your peers talk about them that you actually are kind of absorbing them so um one of the things that i highly recommend um in the next week and a half is thinking about what areas which poets do you still have questions about so you can bring those to the study session that we're going to do on the last day of class. Because um, I will be taking through all the poets we've studied once again, but on a much faster, you know, trajectory. Um, I just want to introduce, oh, oh, go ahead, Sarah, you have a question? Yeah, will there be a time where you'll go over um, what we can expect for like the format of the final? Yes, that will be. Um, on that Thursday when I prep you for the final. Yeah, but it will be, I've already said that it will have short essays. So it won't be, it's not a surprise, but surprise, you're gonna have to write essays. I know it's shocking, <laughs> but it, they won't be super long essays and you'll be able to pull it off in the amount of time that we have, okay? Um, and I will be introducing, for those who came late, I will be introducing our next um, paper um, on 
on Tuesday in class, but I will be posting it before then. So um, you'll get an announcement, your final paper. Was there a question? Mohammed, yes. Um, is the paper the final or are they? No. No, this is the second paper. There's two papers and a final. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, when is the final? Um, I sent out an email an announcement about it. Um, I have to look it up, but it's it's in the announcements if you want to take a look or I'll look at it in just a second. I'm just about to share my screen now. So. I know it's yeah. December 8th at 10 30 a.m. Thank you. December 8th at 10 30. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, just briefly, I want to just give you a really quick introduction to Sylvia Plath. Um, she is another poet that gets grouped with Anne Sexton, even though during Anne Sexton's life, she was Anne Sexton was really famous. She got Pulitzer Prizes, she was, you know, well received. Sylvia Plath was not as famous during her lifetime. Um, she was famous after her death. Um, so I really want that to be, and, but they get grouped together because they both committed suicide. And they both wrote poetry that wrote openly about that challenged um, male motifs in poetry and also wrote openly about being a woman, being a mother, um, things like that. And so I do want to just caution you that just because these poets are back to back does not mean that they're so, and because they committed suicide and suffered from mental health issues doesn't mean they're the same. They are considered this confessional group of poets that we'll talk about a little bit more on Tuesday. But I just want to give you an introduction into Sylvia Plath because a lot of times when people read Ariel, they read Ariel with the idea that, oh, these were the poems that she wrote the month before she died, before she committed suicide. And they've been kind of mythologized and degraded in some ways because of that. Um, but I want to introduce her as something more than, you know, Ariel is a, is a brilliant work. And um, it's something that holds up the test of time. It's something that people read sometimes when they're 16 years old and they read again when they're 80 years old and they feel it just as much. I can tell you that it, it, means, it means more to me as I get older. And I think that's really important in regards to art. So just briefly, before I send you off to Thanksgiving, um, I want you to have some information about Sylvia Plath and I want you to come prepared reading her poems um, for class on Tuesday. Uh, she lived from 1932 to 1963. She, was, she lived for 30 years. She was born in Boston and she was the daughter of a German immigrant um, professor named Otto Plath, um, who ended up dating one of his students and marrying her Ariella Schrober. Um, she, so he ended up dying in 1940 when Plath was only eight years old and that significantly changed the financial circumstances of their family. Her mom had to go to work. Um, they moved to Wesley, Massachusetts and her mother would, ran a secretarial um, studies program at Boston University. Uh, but Plath was a gifted student. Um, it, there's a new biography out about her called Red Comet, which is literally that thick. I'll try to bring it to class on um, Tuesday. Uh, but it, it's a brilliant biography, but it goes over like all her school grades and everything she turned in. And she was a straight A student, but also like a type A personality of having to get everything right. Um, she won all kinds of awards as a student and published stories a lot like in like, 17 magazine and um, really popular magazine. She, short, she published a lot of short stories. Um, she attended Smith College um, on scholarship and continued to excel. She won this Mademoiselle, Madame, Mademoiselle um, fiction contest um, for one year. Um, and she got this guest editorship at the magazine at the following summer. And this is what she wrote her only novel about called The Bell Jar. It's about a mental break she has, but it's also about this experience of working um, in, in this job at Mademoiselle, not as, I can't say Mademoiselle, um, but she, it's, the job is not about being an editor. It's about, you know, um, being a little doll, basically being, being a, a woman and being, um, it's, it's a really interesting um, exploration of that. If you haven't read The Bell Jar, it's um, 
It's a fascinating meme. And fun fact, I think it's still on there. If you Google the Wikipedia page for um, the bell jar, you'll see a reference to one of my articles, which is kind of funny. <laughs> I didn't put it there. It's fair. Um, okay. And then she, what she suffered from in her life was bipolar disorder, um, which is a treatable disease now. Um, but during her lifetime, there was no treatment, only electroshock, electric shock therapy. Um, and what she experienced through her life are a series of um, debilitating depressions where she would inevitably try to commit suicide. And when she was 30, she, she succeeded. Um, she earned a Fulbright to study at Cambridge University in England. And that's where she met the poet Ted Hughes, who eventually became her husband in 1856. Um, Ted Hughes is a very famous poet in his own right. He just died recently. Well, I guess it's not recently to you, but to me. Um, and because of that, it made, because he had the rights, because when they were, when she died, he had all the rights to her journals and, and, and Ariel and all of the work that hadn't yet been published. And so it was finally released. And so that's when her unabridged diaries were finally published. It was an exciting time for people who studied Plath. Um, she, and during her lifetime, she published two major works, The Bell Jar, the novel, and her poetry volume, The Colossus. Um, in 1962, her marriage ended um, because Hughes was um, cheating on her. Uh, they had two young children and um, she was taking care of them by herself. Um, and also suffering a mental break at the same time. And during that time, she wrote furiously, writing two to three poems a day. And that's what became um, uh, Ariel. Uh, she did end up um, committing suicide by inhaling gas from a kitchen oven. Um, and it's, it's a horrible um, scene. Her children were in the other rooms, like she taped off their rooms so that they wouldn't um, experience the gas as well. But it's a terrible story. Um, she was suffering a great deal. Um, well, but she was not famous at this time when she died, you guys. Um, just really important to state that again. She's not famous until she died. And then Ariel was published by Hughes and to great acclaim. And it became like a relic of her depression and her suicide. Um, and she became kind of like, she kind of got lifted up based on that. Um, when she was younger, she experimented a lot with the villanelle and other forms. She's a lot like Elizabeth Bishop in that way. Um, and she was also greatly influenced by writers like D.H. Lawrence, James Joyce, Dostoevsky, Virginia Woolf, Henry James, um, Theodore Rupke, um, Emily Dickinson, and um, the names Robert Lowell and, Sex and Anne Sexton were grouped with her because of this idea of the so-called um, confessional uh, school of poetry, which we'll be talking about, but basically it's using your own experiences as um, what you're going to be writing about. Just briefly, the last thing I'm going to say is that she said about her own poetics, I think that personal experience shouldn't be a kind of shut box and mere looking narcissistic experience. I believe it should be generally relevant to such things as Hiroshima and Dachau and so on. So she was, she was not afraid to use, um, when you're going to be reading her, you're going to read her personal experience, but I want you to see all of the reference out of it. It's not just a navel gazing experience. Like it's, it's collaging in, in a similar way to what Sexton's doing, to what Elliot was doing, but in a, like in a, her level of imagism, her level of of the image is so intense that I really want you to focus on that while you're reading her. So, um, oh, I didn't take off. The, you don't have to finish your response journal because you already did. There's no response journal. I just want you to read um, Ariel um, over the break. If you haven't already read it, where did my Ariel go? Oh no. Um, if you haven't, if you haven't um, already read it, even if you have, um, please make sure that. Um, <laughs> so you can confirm that I'm in there. I'm still in there. That's good. Thanks. That's funny on the Wikipedia page. I don't know why it's in there. It's an article I wrote when I was like right out of grad school. Um, so I want you just re read um, the poems from Ariel as many as you have, have the time to spend time with. 
um, and come ready to discuss them in class on Tuesday. Uh, we will be you know, doing group work on some of the poems. Um, and I would like you to choose a few that speak to you from the collection. So come with some in mind, okay? I'm not gonna assign them to you. I want you to choose some, okay? Questions about that? Wait, so her husband cheated on her and then he made money off of her death afterwards. Oh, we'll talk about that on Tuesday. Don't you worry. Yeah. You. Yeah. You. I wanted you to know that before you read the poems. That's all. Okay. Keep that in mind. <laughs> um, Muhammad and, and uh, Jenna, you have, um, you have some, you have your hands up. I don't know if Muhammad's um, is residual or do you have a question? Oh, I, yeah, I put, I clicked mine by accident. Oh, no problem. Okay. Um, my question is not related to S Sylvia Plath. It's um, for paper two. Do you have the deadline like set already? I, I guess I'll see it in, when you post the actual assignment, but I was just curious when the deadline will be, if you knew it already. Yeah, I, I thought it was in the actual, I thought I posted it already, but. Oh, you might've, my bad. <laughs> not, um, I will. Let me just, before I say it out loud, I just, I'll, you know what? I can't look at it while I'm recording, but no I will send an email after class that confirms exactly when it's due. How's that? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's perfect. You're welcome. I just don't want to misspeak. <laughs> yes, lucky. So. I'm just playing with the thing. Like, it's really cool. Okay. Technology. <laughs> Your cat seems to be having a nice class as well. Yes, she is. <laughs> We yeah, all love your cat. Well, thank you. Thank you. Her name's Clementine. She's eight months. Aww. She's my pride and joy. I wish you could bring her to class. That'd be cool. She'd probably scratch out with people. <laughs> doesn't like people. Chat with. <laughs> That's okay. Cats are like that. They have their own way. All right. Well, I will let you all go and I will stay on in case you have individual questions. But let me just say before you leave, I am thankful to have you as a class. I really enjoy getting to speak with you and hear your thoughts about these poets that mean so much to me and it's really it's really enriched my semester and I or my quarter I really appreciate it and I just want you to know that so I hope you um have a wonderful break you get a little break you get some pie you get some turkey or something to eat um and I will be enjoying my son home from college over the next few days and then I will see you in person on Tuesday. So happy Thanksgiving, you guys. Thank you. Happy Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, so sorry to confirm. Um, yes. Are you posting the assignment for paper two this Tuesday or next Tuesday? I thought it was this Tuesday. I'm thinking next now. I'm going to go over it in class next Tuesday, but I'm going to post it um, today or tomorrow just so that okay. it's there so you can work on it. But I just didn't, I didn't want to, announce it in class because there's yeah. so few people here mm -hmm. okay well thank and you Jesse, and Jesse and I am working on the grades for the first paper I'm only halfway through so yeah. um Elizabeth yeah. posted something you are a W I'm sorry you you don't have your grade yet but you will excellent thank you so much you're welcome yeah thank you so much have a great uh happy Thanksgiving you're welcome you too How's it oh, going? Uh, it's, it's it's going. Yeah, you okay? Yeah, I actually got a Clementine for a whole, the whole like emotional support thing. So good. Yeah, I got her about like three months, two months ago, I think. Yeah, that's she's good. A, um, she's a um, she's uh, you know like one of those. I got her at the um at the at the shelter. So yeah, so she knows. She's like, oh yeah, this is my job. I'm gonna I'm gonna be here for him. Yeah. But um, I just wanted to apologize. I, I didn't necessarily go to class. I was dealing with a lot. Um, okay, let me stop recording.